This is part of an occasional series of stories inspired by discoveries in the Wentworth Woodhouse archives. Our story starts here, in the gardens of Wentworth House. Somewhere next to a gate between the pleasure grounds and the gardens was a small gatehouse called Menagerie Lodge. In 1787, this was ground zero for the smallpox outbreak in Wentworth. It is 50 years after the children of the first Marquess of Rockingham received the new and perilous medical procedure that came to be known as variolation, a deliberate infection with an active but mild form of smallpox that gave immunity to the disease. It is still nine years before Edward Jenner's revolutionary first use of the much safer cowpox vaccine. Inoculation against smallpox, though now cheaper and safer, is still out of reach for the masses who cannot afford the fees and the cost of several weeks isolation. Wentworth Woodhouse is now in the hands of William Wentworth Fitzwilliam, 4th Earl Fitzwilliam of Ireland and 2nd of Great Britain. After 16 years of childless marriage, William and his wife Charlotte finally have a long-awaited child, a male heir to inherit the titles, vast wealth and estates of the Wentworth Fitzwilliams. But the future of two earldoms hangs by the single fragile thread that is the life of Charles Wentworth Fitzwilliam. Given Lady Charlotte's age, 38, and her near death after childbirth, the chances of having other children are vanishingly small. No wonder then that the Earl and Countess are anxious and protective of their son. A quarter of all infants died before their first birthday, and half of all children died before puberty. Little Charles is 11 months old, and not yet inoculated. Mercifully, the village of Wentworth and those around it have been free of smallpox for the last four years. But that is about to change. At the beginning of 1787, outbreaks appeared again throughout the British Isles, in cities, ports and market towns, leading to public meetings, fierce debate, and in some places, to mass inoculations. In April, with smallpox once again sweeping the country, the Earl wrote with explicit instructions regarding the preparations of his son's room at Wentworth Woodhouse. Don't let any person work in the rooms preparing for the little boy who lives in a house where the smallpox has been. A week or ten days before we get to Wentworth, those rooms should be thoroughly washed and cleaned. Christopher Horner, the horse trainer at Wentworth Woodhouse, had been due to collect a horse from the family's home, Milton Abbey in Cambridgeshire. Remembering this, the Earl sent an urgent message post-haste the following day with fresh instructions. As smallpox is in your neighbourhood, before he sets out, I wish you would ascertain that he has not been near any person who has had it, nor been in a house where it has been. It seems the Earl's concerns were well-founded. The following day, her ladyship received a letter from Mrs Crofts, the housekeeper, at Wentworth. My lady, I very much regret to inform you that one of John Mann's children at the gate has got the smallpox. I understand that none of them are inoculated and I fear there is little probability of their escaping catching it. It is not known whether John Mann, who worked in the Fitzwilliams menagerie and sometimes as a stable hand in the stables, had been inoculated with other household staff ten years before. But it is clear that his four girls, Anne, aged six, Martha, aged four, Tabitha, just one, and newborn Mary had not. It was too late to stop the disease spreading. Christopher Horner was already seriously ill with smallpox. At the height of the pandemic 50 years before, the survival rates for smallpox had been just one in four, with blindness, disfigurement and physical impairments commonplace. Despite mutations reducing its severity, it remained a killer. In a letter to his steward, Benjamin Hall, the Earl wrote, If man chooses to have his children inoculated, let it certainly be done at my expense. 
I did not like to say anything before that was more than a hint upon the subject, for whether it is to be done or not is a matter to be decided upon only by the parents themselves. The Earl feared that the disease would rip through the surrounding areas, like Greaseborough, where the children were very numerous. He believed their only hope was to be inoculated. I don't know the sentiments of the poor people about inoculation, whether they do not approve of it or whether they do not practice it on account of expense. If the latter is the case, I would be at the expense of inoculating the whole village of Greaseborough, and likewise of Wentworth, Courtworth, and the Huff. I have one caution, however, to add, that in making this proposal to the parents, no sort of authority must be used to engage them to accept it. If they themselves don't feel the benefit and are not really eager to have their children inoculated, I would not have it done on any consideration. Mr. Bauer would undertake such a job for a moderate sum. I would then have the parents who have children spoke to upon the subject. While Benjamin Hall's account of his actions has not survived, we do know what the village of Wentworth ultimately decided. And based on newspaper accounts of the debates that raged fiercely in other villages and towns, we can reconstruct what might have happened next. In mid-July, the steward was asked to speak to parents with children in Wentworth, probably at an open-air public meeting in the village. Well, you've heard the facts from Surgeon Bauer. The great danger we face from smallpox, the advantages of variolation. Earl Fitzwilliam will pay for every child in Wentworth to be inoculated. But his lordship has made it clear that this can only happen if there is general agreement from parents. I've heard this variolation can give you madness and the king's evil. Surgeon Bauer. In some cases, these may be inherited, but they cannot be spread by inoculation. But does it work? My cousin's boy got smallpox, even though he'd had his inoculation. Hey, the problem is, it doesn't give you a proper smallpox. The late great Dr. Mead wrote, you could still get smallpox afterwards. Sir, you are mistaken. I fear you have misremembered. Dr. Mead said exactly the opposite. The Society of Physicians in London have said there has never been a case of genuine smallpox happening twice in the same person. Ma'am, your cousin's boy may perhaps have caught chickenpox, which looks similar. Mr Hall, I'm a poor widow. My oldest lads are nine and ten. My family needs the wages they bring in. I can't afford to keep them at home for two or three weeks. The Earl will see no one goes hungry. God Almighty inflict smallpox upon us to punish and purify our souls. I say it's a sin to stand in his way. I am no priest, but it seems the greater crime to permit your children to catch this disorder when their bodies are not prepared for it. Some people never have the smallpox. My children may escape it. This does not happen very often in a part of the world where trade is carried out. But yes, a few may be immune to the uh, disease, but you condemn them to a life of fear. And any woman who catches it when she's with child has little chance of recovery. Mr Hall, I'd have my kids inoculated, but you said we must all agree. It would be a difficult thing to keep them shut up inside, but we all know parents who couldn't or wouldn't do it. I fear that by wandering about, they could cause an epidemic. We can only proceed if there is general agreement. It is a duty on all parents to prepare their children for the world. This is a duty owing to your families, to that society of which we are all members, and to the world in general. It is a duty on parents to inoculate their children as a means to preserve life. I urge you to vote for inoculation. You're getting paid for this. Of course, you want us to vote for it. Mr Webster, show some respect. Well, if there are no other questions and comments, it's time for a show of hands. Yay? Nay? I will inform his lordship that there is not a general majority for inoculation. I received your letter of the 23rd giving an account of what you had done, and as it appears that it would not be agreeable to the parents generally, the scheme must be laid aside altogether. It possibly might tend to spread the disease, but whether it did or did not, certainly many people would think it had done so, and many would say so whether they thought it or not. 
so the disorder must take its course. You will let me know from time to time what progress it makes. I fear it will become very fatal as the season advances. The first deaths were recorded in the middle of July. The outbreak ran until Christmas. Of John and Mary Mann's four daughters, all survived their brush with smallpox, although only one of them married, and Mary, the baby, was to die of convulsions at age five. At this distance, we can only guess at the long-term effects of smallpox on its victims. Christopher Horner, too, survived to make a slow recovery. And what of the Earl's family? They avoided Wentworth Woodhouse that year. Staff and visitors who had not had smallpox were advised not to venture into the town. And in February, thankfully, young Charles Wentworth Fitzwilliam was successfully inoculated against smallpox. However, when an outbreak of measles in John and Mary Mann's family in June kept the Fitzwilliams from their beloved home once again, it was the last straw. These measles are the most provoking things in the world. It is the greatest mortification to Lady Fitzwilliam and myself to be debarred the pleasure of being at Wentworth. When we can venture there, God only knows. Seek out a house for man, for though during the illness of his children his family cannot be removed, the comfort of the other people must not be put to risk for the sake of mine. Yet it must be as soon as they are recovered. Cannot permit a family of little children to be living at the garden gate, or anywhere within the park. This I mean as a general rule. In fact, the Earl relented his general rule to resettle John Mann and his family to Morley Lodge, one of the lodges at the outer edge of the park. With all the benefits of hindsight, we can see that the decision not to inoculate cost the village of Wentworth the lives of 20 of their children and probably adversely affected another 200. In an age where fewer than half the population could read and write, when there was a deeply ingrained distrust of the medical profession and a lack of reliable, accessible evidence on which to base their decisions, parents made the best choices they could. The Earl too acted to preserve life. His caution ensured the survival of his son and heir, who lived to become the fifth Earl Fitzwilliam. And although his ambitious offer to pay out of his own pocket for a mass inoculation programme was rejected at this time, public opinion was changing. New scientific discoveries were just around the corner in the fight against smallpox. Mm -hmm.